I have seen people occasionally move away from jujitsu or de-emphasize jujitsu and emphasize more um, street quote unquote training. And, and I'm not talking about Burton. I don't, I don't want to anybody to draw that assumption because I like Burton. I think he's on a good path. I'm talking about uh, my own students in times past. Okay. I, w- I would see them veer away from jujitsu and gravitate more towards, oh, we want to train more functional street and they'll focus more on clinch and stand up. And part of, and, and I know you've seen this too, and we both recognize part of what's there. And part of what's there is the fact that it's impossible to hide your weaknesses in jujitsu. Because if you're willing to commission, right? Because you will get oh, yeah. tapped. You're going to get tapped out. You're going to get held down. You're going to be dominated. And there's just no, no, well, I did pretty good. Or I didn't, he got you. He got the choke or whatever. And that's part of what makes it so healthy. But, you know, you can play clinch. You can pummel. You can even box and exchange blows with somebody who's a much better striker than you are, a much better grapp- grappler or clinch person than you are. And still make it appear like a game and protect your ego in a way that you can't with jujitsu and so I, I unfortunately I see sometimes these guys gravitate more towards that and the excuse they'll use is is street but in reality it's just a way to uh, to avoid the 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 rigid rod of truth as Wunak would say which is inevitable with jujitsu and that same and I think I don't think that everybody does that but I've seen people fall for that but that same the same reason why people who are avoiding rolling and having to, to confront all the stuff that happens as you age or your athletes get younger or whatever, when you're rolling, the same reasons clinch and stand up doesn't force that same level of recognition on you is the same reasons why it's easy to insert all this other stuff that you're talking about. You know, if you, if you come in with a, with a goofy lock or something like that and you try it in jujitsu, you're going to get, the guy's just going to, well, that's not going to work. Right. But you can pretend to sneak who knows what in a stand-up play. But you do – so you are seeing a similar – so that I would make this argument. You are seeing the same thing move its way back into jujitsu, jitsu sure. because there are now plenty of schools who are just quote-unquote self-defense schools – which always, which not always, but generally means that their students are not rolling in a, you know, in a free form manner where, you know, it's you and me tap and we go to submission Mm -hmm. and they're generally not competing and they're generally not allowing outsiders in to roll with them. Yes. And I've seen this happen more and more. I've seen one of those, don't you have one of those schools in your area? We do have one of those schools in our area, and I have never said a disparaging word about how they choose to train or their path, but they, they believe that what we are doing is not authentic. Right. That somehow, because sometimes we will grab a sleeve, somehow that is less authentic right. than their students not knowing that sometimes someone will grab your sleeve and put a foot on your bicep. Right. That somehow my guy's doing an OOPA perfectly, you know, and, and I always tell my students, I didn't even know how to do the OOPA until about two years ago. Mm-hmm. Somehow my students doing an OOPA perfectly is different on the mat than it is on the street. Right. Right. Isn't that crazy? That, that I, argument, I know you know this, but that one drives me crazy more than any other. I mean, the, the circumstances, all of a sudden, the gravity of the circumstances go way up, and now the need for aliveness becomes less. It's completely illogical. Well, don't, didn't you and Andy were just talking about this, how, how you fall to the level of your training. Right. And the more pressure put on you, the more you will fall to that. Yeah. So, and you and I both know that in, and in particular, in the case of what you're talking about, it's a way for them to avoid the reality of what happens when you train a combat sport. It is also because they don't know how to get people good. Now they might have someone who is good in their gym. I am not denying that 
one of these sports schools, I mean, I'm sorry, one of these self-defense BJJ schools doesn't have a guy that could come over to my gym and give everyone a hard time. Right. But it is difficult to get everyone that comes into your gym better. And the only way to do that is through aliveness, is right. through proper drilling. Right. And because they don't know how to do that, it is easier just to insulate them from the outside, say that we are doing the street here, we are doing self-defense, right. and then roll in a very limited manner mm -hmm. and then keep everyone from coming in there. I remember Connolly telling me about one of his purple belts who traveled somewhere. And he, the first gym he called in the area, they said, we don't allow anyone... To, to come over. Right. And I understand from a safety standpoint, being careful about who comes over, but if someone tells me they, they train with their purple belt with Chris Connolly, um, I know that person knows how to train. Right. And they're welcome to come. But you know he was, he was told to go somewhere else. Yeah. You know, what's interesting about what you're saying is um, a good example of this. And I'm not sure, to be honest with you, I'm not sure exactly why it happens. I, and, I, and I fully uh, recognize that I gave you the most nefarious answer. It, it's one of many options. I mean, the reason why I talked about it uh, being a, a way for people to kind of protect their egos, because I was talking specifically about a couple students I've had in times past that I saw move away from the kind of training that, that I think is healthy and that we all do and move more towards the, the street aspect of it. But in reality, no, I'm not just, I'm, I'm agreeing. I'm saying they're doing well, it for the same reason on the ground. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I agree with you. Like you rarely see it. You don't see a 27 year old head coach at a BJJ school who competes and rolls hard touting. Let's all train self-defense. It's always a guy who has gotten 45, 50 years old, Rolling with his rolling with people is is you know it it is difficult as we get older to come to grips with what is really happening right you know and most of our students especially the ones that have been with us a long time they are better than us yeah should be, be because there is no sport on the planet where a guy at 45 is better than a guy with the, at 25. Right. You know, it just doesn't happen. So I, I agree. Jitsu, we can keep up a lot better than we can just about any other sport. We can keep up. We just have to change our outlook. When, right. when we were 25, the outlook was, I'm going to tap that guy every 30 seconds, every minute or whatever, like just our egos. Yeah. And when we're 45, sometimes with a 25-year-old purple belt, it's just being able to do good fundamental jujitsu. Yeah, and survive and, and roll another survive, day. Survive, defend, roll another day, you know, make them work. Be a good training partner. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, but, but yeah. that is a, that's tough. It is a lot easier to just say, okay, we focus on the street. Yeah, you know. no, 100%. And, you know, we see that. But there's another piece, too, as well. I mean, that's why I was saying uh, I think there are multiple reasons. So I'll run this one by you. And I don't know the answer for this. But Hickson, for example, um, has made some, I think, valuable and true, uh, worthwhile and reasonable criticisms of IBJJF and the nature of how jiu-jitsu has changed in the 20. 30 years since he started teaching here in the States. And having witnessed that evolution, I understand what he's talking about. I feel like I understand what he's talking about, having talked to him about it, and agree with him. So when I started jujitsu in the, in the 90s, it was very much about fighting. Not the self-defense like somebody's gonna put you in a wrist lock or something, you know, what do you do with a drunk guy in the street? There was that, but it was about fighting. Everything we were doing was related to Vale Tudo. The crossover to MMA was, that's what we were doing. We were doing MMA on the ground, basically. And, and there was always slaps. Howder, when he first would come to Oregon, I don't think we ever rolled where he didn't hit me in the head at least once or twice. It was just part of what we did. Fighting was what jiu-jitsu was about. And then it hyper-specialized, and, and you have schools and people who are training specifically for the IBJJF rules. 
and in that in that there's a fear that the the really fearsome awesome fighting art of of Gracie Jiu Jitsu Brazilian Jiu Jitsu will get lost. So I understand his point. The solution that he's advocated for it and what I've seen as far as the the self defense tournament he has is a kata. It, it's two guys to go out and do the self-defense techniques, some of which I like and some of which I don't. There are valuable, solid jujitsu movements in the old Gracie self-defense system, and then there's ones that we both know we've made major improvements on. But, um, but that's not the point. What I'm talking about is a training method. They're literally working against a cooperating opponent the way you would in Aikido, and then you have a panel of judges who score them like you would kata and actually how do chris re refereed one of these matches and while he's there he's wondering why do you need a referee i don't understand why i have a referee and and so no. you have a legitimate problem that i think he's identified but the solution to it is exactly what we should not do it will it will destroy and kill the art 